Again, good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's MedTalk event. It's part of the Merkin Initiative on Payment Reform and Clinical Leadership here at the Brookings Institution. I'm Mark McClellan. I direct the initiatives on value and innovation in healthcare in our Center for Health Policy. And we are very glad that all of you here in the room, all of you online, could join us today. Uh, we're very pleased to host this discussion on some uh, timely and critical issues involving key aspects of health care reform, which everybody talks about in some ways, but in many ways talks past and doesn't really focus on the core role that improving acute unscheduled care, often referred to as emergency care, plays in the success and failures of broad efforts around health care reform. I want to begin by thanking the Richard Merkin Foundation for their support uh, for this broad initiative on linking up clinician leadership and real uh, reform in our healthcare system. And I want to thank all of our participants today for their time and efforts in preparing for what you're about to hear about. The emergency physicians, the policymakers, the senior leaders who are part of today's event uh, have taken, uh, have undertaken a lot of efforts to try to change the way that we think about the delivery of acute care and the implications of trying to get to transform acute care systems for our financing, uh, the way that payments work, the way that benefits emer involving emergency care or d are designed, and the way that many other regulatory policies that affect emergency care work out. A number of our participants are parts of health systems, states, hospitals that are implementing reforms aimed at improving the quality of acute care and the quality of overall health care while lowering overall health care costs. Uh, this, as I said, is a critical part of health care reform. The acute system in America really touches all parts uh, of healthcare delivery, obviously includes hospital-based emergency departments and outpatient offices. It involves freestanding emergency departments and acute care centers, primary care and specialty office practices, telemedicine providers, paramedical professionals uh, before patients uh, reach the hospital. Each of these is a critical part of this unique uh, and big element of our health care system that needs to be available in one form or another 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, for people with acute illnesses ranging from uh, a severe earache to uh, a major uh, automobile accident. In many instances, this is the first entry point for Americans into the health care system. And in many instances, the, the way that their acute care is provided influences fundamentally uh, many other decisions and many other aspects of their care and health care costs and outcomes. The demand for acute services has been increasing. Uh, up to over 350 million acute care visits uh, in the most recent year, for which we have full numbers, 2011. Uh, projections since then, especially with coverage expansion, suggest that the numbers are even larger. Uh, and importantly, many of these visits are viewed as preventable. As a result, not surprisingly, acute care has been the target of many health care reform efforts, initiatives involving public and private payers, Hospitals, physicians, patients are intended to prevent acute health care problems from occurring in the first place, and when they do occur, to shift them to less costly, more convenient settings, and then finally, in the course of delivering acute care, to find better ways uh, to do it, to get better outcomes, or at least as good outcomes, at significantly lower costs. And I go through each of these areas of acute care reform briefly. First, a major objective of chronic disease management programs such as patient-centered medical homes and care, man care management activities and accountable care organizations is to reduce the complications that lead to emergency department and hospital use. Many of these programs are showing results, in some cases big results. Just this week, uh, we had another uh, uh, Merkin Initiative webinar on transformative changes in pediatric asthma care, which are substantially reducing emergency department visits by children with asthma. These activities are occurring largely outside of the emergency department, though emergency departments can help in identifying at-risk and frequent user patients. A second major objective of many system-wide health care reform initiatives is to shift care to lower acuity and more convenient settings. 
For example, uh, as we've also talked about as part of this initiative, oncology patient-centered medical homes have used trained nurses and their own staff with expanded hours to expand access over the phone and to support better triage care. For example, consul consults in medical oncology and hematology in Pennsylvania have seen a number of hospital admissions and ED evaluations fall by shifting them to same day or next day appointments and, and home care. Uh, steps to make such lower cost acute care alternatives available like phone access, telemedicine, acute care centers, uh, make these more available for appropriate patients and to enable, in the course of doing that, patients not only to save time but maybe reduce their out-of-pocket costs are occurring for a wide range of health problems throughout our healthcare system. Emergency departments and the clinicians in them are usually not directly involved in these initiatives, but we'll hear today about how they can be and how they can get better support for supporting uh, these shifts to more effective acute uh, and efficient acute care while still lowering overall health care costs. Finally, we've seen clinical pathways, uh, new information technologies, and other supports uh, getting developed to help improve the care of patients who are in the emergency department and need to be there, uh, particularly for common health problems such as uh, chest pain and other common problems that show up in emergency rooms like headaches and back pains. New approaches to care inside the emergency department, inside the hospital, are a focus of these reforms. So as I've mentioned, many of these, most of these reforms are happening outside of the emergency department, but still may have dramatic effects on the patients who use the EDs and on the uh, resources and needs for, uh, needs for resources within emergency departments. Since emergency departments usually depend on fee-for-service payments for reimbursement, these shifts can have big impacts on emergency department finances, as well as the availability of resources for emergency departments to handle their critical functions, including, including acute care emergencies and emergency preparedness for anyone who might need help. So today we're going to talk about some of the opportunities for improving acute care, for changing payments and other policies to support higher value acute care uh, with some of the people who have been leading the efforts uh, to make these kinds of changes and to make sure that we're accounting for the challenges that can arise in emergency care and, and acute care more generally uh, as we implement health care reforms nationally uh, to avoid unintended effects on critical emergency department functions. Before I pass on this event to our uh, next uh, to the next round and to Jesse Pines, I want to discuss a few administrative items. As I mentioned, we are broadcasting today's event live through the Brookings website, and we are recording it. It'll be available on the Brookings website in the coming days. To ensure our audio quality, we'd like to remind you to turn cell phones to silent and to please uh, uh, save your questions for the Q&A portion of each panel, but do have some questions ready. We also ask you to join the conversation online by using the hashtag MedTalk. Uh, it's up on the screen behind me as well, MedTalk. Uh, those of you who are attending virtually can use this hashtag to post questions to our panelists for our Q&A segments. For those of you in the room, uh, we're going to have those segments at the end of each of the upcoming panels, and if you've got a question, raise your hand when the time comes, and we're going to get to as many of you as possible. So to get us going, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Jesse F Pines, an emergency physician uh, at uh, George Washington University uh, who has written extensively on issues related to emergency medicine policy, also a visiting Merkin scholar here at the Brookings Institution. Jesse, thank you. Thank you, Mark, and welcome to all of you today joining us in person and on the web. Uh, I finished my emergency medicine residency in 2004 uh, and have been a practicing emergency physician, uh, researcher, and teacher ever since. Over the past decade since I began practice, the landscape of emergency medicine has changed. The past decade saw dramatic increases in visits to US EDs with, with over 130 million by, by the most recent estimates. Visits to doctor's offices have also increased. There was, there's been a dramatic expansion of other settings for acutely ill and injured patients like urgent care centers, retail clinics, and freestanding emergency departments. 
The past decade also saw rapid rises in emergency department crowding, primarily in hospital-based CDs, caused by rising visits, greater intensity of care brought on by expanding life-saving technology and greater specialization. The acute care system today delivers tremendous value as the critical staging ground for the ill and injured. It's always open for emergencies big and small. It's the safety net and it's the front line for disasters like Hurricane Katrina and the Boston Marathon bombing. But at the same time, we can do better. Despite delivering top-notch results for the critically sick, our system has its problems. It's fragmentation, poor information flow, and lack of connection with the broader healthcare continuum. We as frontline providers do life-saving work every day, but still we can do better and do it more efficiently. My passion is finding solutions for emergency care's most important problems. But today, one of the most pressing problems is spiraling health care costs, which is set to become one-fifth of the U.S. economy by 2020. The acute care system delivers great value, but today we will discuss ways to further improve value, create a more patient-centered system, and ultimately reduce costs. We will hear about the revolution in acute care going on inside the emergency department, across the community, and in health systems. In a moment, we'll hear from Dr. Arthur Kellerman, Dean of the Hebear School of Medicine, Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, and an emergency physician. Art will start us out by describing some of the distinct features of acute care and how those play into reforming the acute care system. Our first panel is titled, A Path to the Right Care in the Right Setting, Innovations and Interventions, and highlights reforms in three states, Colorado, Maryland, and Washington State. Payment reforms in these communities have sparked successful interventions that have improved the value of acute care. In our second panel, we'll hear from federal government policymakers and implementers as well as a senior advisor and emergency physician in one of the nation's largest integrated providers, Kaiser, and how alignment of financial incentives between payers, providers, and facilities can support system integ integration and transformation. Each panelist will make brief remarks, then we'll move into a guided discussion by the moderators, myself in the first panel and Mark in the second, for each, after each panel discussion, we'll have some time for audience questions. Finally, I'll provide some practical next steps and recommendations for payers and policymakers, physicians and health systems, about how each can play a role in improving the value of acute care and what the roadmap might be from where we are today to integrated acute care. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Arthur Kellerman. Good morning, everyone. Before I speak, uh, I want to tell you all how proud I am to be the Dean of America's Medical School at the Uniformed Services University. But I want to be equally clear that I'm about to speak as an individual, as a doc, not as a dean, and not on behalf of the university or the US Department of Defense. You'll understand why, because some of my remarks are personal. I'd like you to go back with me for a moment to the start of my career as a young emergency physician at the Regional Medical Center in Memphis, Tennessee, where I met a patient we'll call Jane. I heard her before I saw her because the wheels on her gurney were rattling because the paramedics were racing up the hall to get her into the emergency department. I could tell at a glance that she was critically ill. She was comatose, her arms and legs were rigidly extended, her blood pressure was sky high, about 240 over 140. My team and I knew what to do. We swung into action. IV lines were inserted. We started powerful medications to begin to bring that incredibly high blood pressure down. I slipped a plastic tube into her airway with one pass to secure her breathing. Ventilator was started, and we had her in the CAT scan within 10 minutes. Now, the clinicians in the room probably know what I saw. It was no surprise to me or any of the team. She had a massive bleed in the center of her brain. It was as if somebody had slipped a hand grenade in there, pulled the pin, and set it off. She didn't have a chance. 
over the next couple of hours, despite the best we knew to do in modern American medicine, her brain continued to swell, her condition continued to deteriorate. One pupil blew, then the other pupil blew. We knew that she was going to be brain dead in a matter of hours. I went out to break the bad news to her family. Two sisters, stony-faced. I started to share the news, and they said, we knew this was going to happen. What do you mean you knew this was going to happen? We told her, we told her she needed to take her medicine. Tell me more. Jane lost her job about six months ago. She'd got a new job, but it didn't have health insurance. She did okay for a few months, but it was just the bills were piling up. And then she told us a couple of weeks ago, I can't do this. I, I, I can't buy my medicine. I can't see my doctor anymore. And I got to feed my babies. And we said, Jane, don't do it. Don't do it. You need to take your medicine. And she said, I need to feed my kids. Jane made the decision any mother would make in that situation, and she paid for it with her life. And all of the sophisticated care that we had to offer her in a level one trauma center, in a tertiary care hospital, could not make a whit of difference. Fast forward about 20 years to another woman in another ER. This is, we'll call her Betty. I met her one evening in our ironically named fast track area of Atlanta's public hospital. I remember the evening well because I had an NPR reporter in tow, Joanne Silverner, who was with me that night. Now, normally, ER docs in the room know, if you want a quiet night, invite a reporter to shadow you. <laughs> Not this night. It was Calcutta in Atlanta. The waiting room was packed. The hallways were full of stretchers, full of admitted patients. Every bay was full. Every exam room was full. Ambulances were stacked up. The other private hospitals in downtown Atlanta had gone on what we call defensive diversion because when Grady went on diversion, every private hospital would immediately go on diversion too to push the traffic back to us because they didn't want poor folks in their ERs. And so the place was just teetering on the brink of collapse. And Joanne's frantically running around with a microphone and her sound tech sort of following all of this. And I went over to the fast track area and there was a stack of charts about this deep. And I'm flipping through it with her and I'm going... Ankle sprain, possible wrist fracture, possible pneumonia, possible throat abscess, med refill. Ha ha, what's that? Med refill. Why are they here? I don't know. I'll, I'll go ask her. And I did go ask her in private. And in hindsight, I really wish I could have brought Joanne in the room. Young woman, not so different in age than the prior woman I told you about. And she's sitting there rather pensively on the the uh, exam table, and I said, ma'am, wh why are you here? It's a busy night. This is a med refill. And she just exploded and said, why am I here? I've got terrible high blood pressure. I take three medications. I need my medicine. I understand that, ma'am, but why didn't you? I did. I went to five primary care clinics in the last three days. No one will see me. I have to have cash up front or they won't see me. And the two places I went that would see me for free said they had, I had to come back in six weeks. That was their first appointment. All I want is my medicine. And she just started crying. She said, I shouldn't have to do this. I've been here 12 hours. Just give me my prescriptions and I'll go. These two stories illustrate the wide spectrum of conditions that we see in a typical emergency department. They also reflect the consequences of a fragmented and sometimes insufficient healthcare system. Several threads tie these together. Both women, both in their mid-30s, both with severe high blood pressure, both ended up in the ER, albeit in very different conditions. Jane, the woman who died, had lost her health insurance and with it, her medication and her access to care. She's an extreme example, but technically speaking, she had what we would call a primary care preventable condition that led to her emergency department visit. Betty's ER visit was an act of desperation. She had what we call a primary care treatable condition. We would all agree that a primary care clinic could easily manage high blood pressure. The problem was not the technical aspects of care. The problem was five primary care clinics didn't want to manage her high blood pressure. And so she did, again, what any rational adult would do. She went where she knew she wouldn't be turned away 
to get the care that she needed. That's why she came to Grady, and that's why she waited 12 hours to see me. Between these extremes, life-threatening emergencies on one hand, quote-unquote non-urgent or non-emergent visits on the other, is a huge middle group of complicated, timely, complex patients that emergency departments focus on sorting out. Now, when I was a young ER doc, a lot of that middle group would actually go to their personal physician, have that problem evaluated, and if they needed to be hospitalized, would be directly admitted to the hospital. But as time has gone on increasingly and primary care has evolved, those patients are more likely to be told, don't come into the office, go directly to the ER. The ER will call us, tell us what's going on, and then we'll either come and check on you or the hospitalist will take care of you. So the emergency department is being used to sort out complex patients that previously went to their doctors. Now, you go to a primary care doc and they'll tell you, they're going to make no bones about it. I don't like this any more than you do, but I can't drop everything in the middle of a day packed with 15-minute visits to see a patient with a complex problem that may take 45 minutes or an hour to sort out when my entire day is packed with scheduled visits. I have to wave these people forward. And so they do. And so emergency departments, in turn, have become this center for diagnostics, primary care, support, and ultimately for decisions about who to admit and who not. This was brought home with a study I did when I was with the RAND Corporation about three years ago. We did an analysis of emergency department use in the country and made some remarkable observations. One, but in 2009, private doctor's offices admitted 1.6 million fewer patients to the hospital than they had in 2003. But that decline was more than offset by a dramatic increase in hospitalizations through the ER, up by 2.7 million. Part of that was simply that the docs offices were shifting those complicated patients and having the ER do the assessment and the admission decision rather than doing it themselves. And so emergency departments are becoming more and more diagnostic centers to support primary care practices, and they're also becoming the gatekeepers to costly inpatient care. Why does that matter? Because if you Google today the most expensive care there is, guess what you'll find? The ER. It's not. The average emergency department visit is about one-tenth as expensive as an average hospital admission. And so making that decision of who gets admitted and who doesn't has profound economic and clinical consequences for patients. And it's one of the most important functions emergency departments do. There's one final role that the ER that I want to mention, and then I'll close. And that is that the ER provides a room with a view into how America's healthcare system works or doesn't work and how healthcare functions at the community level. If you want to know here in Washington, D.C., or in Topeka, or Seattle, or wherever you may be, how health care and health are in your community, go to your local ER. If public health is under-resourced or poorly managed, you'll see patients with vaccine-preventable diseases, smoking-related health problems, preventable injuries, and foodborne illnesses. If primary care is fragmented or weak, the waiting room would be full of patients with problems like Betty's, that could be prevented with primary care, but aren't being prevented with primary care. And if the hospital itself is poorly managed, the entire ER, including critical care bays, exam rooms, hallways, waiting room, will be packed with ill and injured patients, many of whom were evaluated hours or even days earlier, but they can't be admitted because there are either no beds available, the place is full, or they're holding beds back for better paying elective admissions. Surely, we can do better than this. That's the opportunity before this room today. I urge all of you, speakers and participants, to envision how we can use the full array of resources, and Lord, we have lots of resources to offer, in a more wise, more effective, and more humane manner to give patients, communities in this country, the care it needs. Done well, we can actually shift even more care out of costly and expensive hospitals and we can align emergency departments and primary care practices as partners in an integrated system of care rather than seeming competitors or folks that are trying to push the patient back and forth instead of helping a patient in a seamless continuum of care. To do this, we're going to have to figure out how to easily and seamlessly share the health information 
that should always accompany the patient so that wherever care is given, that information is accessible and available and can be readily sent back to the patient's medical home and their primary care provider. We can do this. 320 Americans, including people like Betty and Jane, deserve no less. Thank you. I'd like to kick off our first panel. The title of this panel is A Path to the Right Care in the Right Setting, Innovations and Interventions. The purpose of this panel is to discuss successful interventions and innovations in improving the value of acute care. When it comes to successful transformation, key elements include a mandate to transform, a supportive infrastructure, and stakeholders who can facilitate transformation, and importantly, dynamic leaders. On this panel today, we're honored to have three dynamic leaders who are leading successful interventions that have enhanced the value of acute care. I'd like to have our panelists uh, come up to the stage. So today we have our three panelists, each of which is going to make some brief comments, and then again we'll be doing a uh, moderated discussion followed by audience questions. Dr. Fermin Baruto, Chairman of Emergency Medicine, University of Maryland, Chesapeake Health System, Clinical Associate Professor of University of Maryland Health System is on the end. Dr. Nathan Schlicker, Regional Director of Quality and an Emergency Physician at so St. Joseph's Medical Center in Washington State, and Associate Director of to the Team Health National Patient Safety Organization is in the middle. And Jennifer Weiler, Vice Chair and Associate Professor of the Department of Emergency Medicine at University of Colorado Denver and an Adjunct Professor in Health Administration at the University of Colorado School of Business. Um, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I need that. So. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Fermin Barreto. Um, as Jesse uh, introduced, I oversee two emergency departments, Upper Chesapeake Medical Center and Hartford Memorial Hospital. Uh, together, we service uh, the Hartford, uh, Hartford County community and see about 93,000 patients uh, per year. Upper Chesapeake Health is part of the University of Maryland medical system, and uh, those two hospitals have a large market share, uh, you know, greater than 50%. Uh, in Harford County. And just as a general construct, uh, the Maryland Emergency Medicine Network has been contracted to provide emergency med uh, medical services to uh, those two hospitals. Um, together, uh, you know, we have been entered into the Global Budget uh, Revenue, GBR, uh, in the state of Maryland, which essentially caps uh, hospital revenue and changes them from a volume to value-based reimbursement. Uh, at the same time, physicians have remained on a volume-based re um, reimbursement for the professional fees. And together, uh, we're trying to find ways to produce win-win situations where we can maintain high quality because we know that we can't cost-cut our way to greatness. So uh, we developed several programs so that we can get the right patient at the right place at the most uh, effective, cost-effective level. And one of the first initiatives that we talked about is low-risk chest pain protocol, which is essentially a clinical pathway where we're trying to decrease clinical variation. Uh, in just the first six months of that program, we've been able to avert over 200 hospital admissions for chest pain and provide appropriate uh, outpatient follow-up and outpatient stress tests for these patients so that we can uh, maintain that high quality. And then uh, our high-risk care plan, which I think every emergency department has seen high-risk care plans. You know, uh, they used to be little cards, and they were called blacklists. You know, they, their emphasis used to be on just opioid diversion or uh, opioid abuse. What we did was have a high-risk care plan that integrated our IT infrastructure, integrated uh, CRISP, which is the Health Information Exchange, and Case Management Investigative Work into a one-page uh, care plan that was essentially integrated into the emergency physician workflow. 
this was a lot more effective than what I've seen in other care plans. And when we did this, our initial pilot of 40, 44 patients showed a decrease in opioid prescriptions by, uh, by over 50%, a decrease in inpatient stays, observation stays by over 40%, and we were able to decrease use, uh, CT utilization, MRI utilization, and x-rays by over 55%. Expanded to over 300 plus patients now, I was expecting to see a significant drop off in effectiveness and actually we've been able to maintain both uh, ED visits, inpatient stays and observation stays, all of them decreasing by over 40%. You know, we're going to be working on that publication shortly as soon as I get extra time in my day. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the next two initiatives, the care clinic and patient callbacks have both been started. The care clinic is essentially the infrastructure that we're developing to start working on chronic disease management. Integrating with the emergency department and providing us with places to send the patients other than an inpatient stay or providing the hospital an opportunity to identify patients that are going to be at risk for uh, either future admissions, observation stays, or uh, utilization of healthcare resources. Uh, and then the patient callback program, which is a program that we developed internally within the Maryland Emergency Medicine Network, uh, essentially provides reimbursement to physicians for calling back their own patients and providing a construct so that they can get tied into case management resources, care, care clinic, um, to uh, essentially both improve patient experience as well as uh, possibly decrease uh, the use of hospital resources. Interestingly, we have seen a decrease in total hospital admissions and observation stays at Upper Chesapeake. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, amount of days that are being utilized by the patients that are still making it in uh, has increased. So the future challenges will be on how they can improve that piece. But as far as the emergency department and partnering with uh, our hospital, you know, we have seen some tremendous improvements. And right now, over 500 hospital admissions just within this past year that we have been able to uh, provide alternatives that maintained quality care. <clears throat> Wonderful. Well, I'm Nathan Schlicker from Washington State. And ours is a tale of reform like so many, uh, born out of conflict. Uh, Well-intentioned uh, government officials coming up with really bad ideas. Uh, now that I've offended you all, let's get down to the nuts and bolts. Uh, and I say this having served in our state Senate, so I've seen both sides of the argument. Uh, but in Washington, there was an idea during our recession uh, that we would just stop paying for unnecessary emergent care. The problem is how do we define unnecessary? As Dr. Kellerman so eloquently laid out, what seems unnecessary by a discharge diagnosis or presenting complaint can often be a catastrophic, life-threatening event. And that's where we came to. And a list got developed, uh, again, by our well-intentioned government officials that included things like chest pain and seizure and coma, hemorrhage and miscarriage, and 700 other things that were just not emergent and you shouldn't be in the ER for. Well, we're ER docs, uh, and we are the canary in the coal mine. Uh, we're often looked at as the problem when I think actually we do stand at the intersection of all failed policy. And so the ER docs of Washington State, we were a plucky little group. Uh, we were a chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians that was so big that we could only afford an eighth of an executive director. But we decided to take on the state. Uh, and we said, no, we can do this better. We're ER docs. We've got a long list of things that if you give us the tools, we think we can save dramatic dollars in healthcare. After a little lawsuit and a few other things, we won. Uh, they decided to start listening. And they said, but we still need to save dollars. And we said, we believe we can save dollars for you. We've got a seven-part plan. Why seven? Hey, it sounds like a great number. Uh, but we've got a seven-part plan that's going to do some things that are revolutionary in medicine, but also complete and utter common sense. We're going to build one integrated HIE delivery model for the state of Washington. Not Epic that will tell you everything. All I want to know as an ER doctor is, where have you been? When have you been there? And what was the chief complaint that you came in? Because when you're the 42-year-old woman in for her first visit of chest pain, that's a different conversation than the 42-year-old woman in for her 45th visit for chest pain, 
who got a cath last week at a different hospital. And just that simple data can dramatically change the direction we go and the conversation that we have while we're in the emergency care setting. And to know that you cross systems that, let's be honest, in our modern healthcare delivery system, do not want to integrate sometimes from market competitive forces and sharing issues, now they talk, at least on three data points. So after that information, we said, well, we've at least known where you are. Now we want to, in the department, change the way that we deliver care. We want to have a standardized approach as all ER doctors in Washington about how we prescribe opiates and how we deal with chronic pain management. And we got that through and we got all doctors to buy into the idea that we cannot be the stopgap for chronic pain. We cannot just make it easier on ourselves or on our patients to treat drug addiction with six Vicodin to get them out the front door. We need to take on the hard task of dealing with addiction. And we brought in help, case managers through social workers that worked with us in department, in real time, generally in business hours, unfortunately, but you know, in real time to help us develop care plans, to work to integrate that into our HIE and to help get people actual care they need, whether that be addiction treatment, mental health, or otherwise, and help coordinate back with primary care so that when it came to the primary care and the patient-centered medical home for chronic disease, we would get them back there. But we saw that the ERs were the place for the acute management of healthcare. The program was novel and revolutionary, and we believed that we could save money. The state went with us for at least a year. And in our first year, we saved $32 million for the state of Washington. They wanted us to save $31 million. We exceeded the budget goals not by denying care, but by improving care. We reduced our narcotic prescribing to all uh, patients on the Medicaid program by 24%. We reduced ED utilizations for our frequent flyers and for all Medicaid clients by 10% and 12% respectively. Dramatic change is not by denying care, but by actually giving physicians the tools they need. And the thing that's been born out of this that I think is revolutionary is the idea that we engage providers in the conversation about how to improve healthcare. It's a novel concept, uh, but it makes common sense. Because in the busy day of the day-to-day -day emergency department we all work, we can't reform healthcare all by ourselves in one department, but we often see the problems and the challenges. And by working together, we were able to improve the system, and we actually now continue to meet. Where once we were literally litigants across the table, the state, the insurers, the hospital association, the medical association, the ER doctors now meet every other month to talk about how we can continue to transform healthcare in Washington and throughout the country. And things like integrating our prescription monitoring program into our HIE so that no longer is there a barrier of access, but instead it's pushed to you, now is what we can do. The future is bright where we work together and collaborate rather than mandate reform. Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Weiler, and thank you for this opportunity uh, for me to talk to you about a pilot program our state has been involved in, a collaboration of the University of Colorado School of Medicine, the University of Colorado Hospital, our local federally qualified health center, MCPN, and Together Colorado, which is a faith-based organization uh, that's the local chapter, but part of a national group. Uh, we are part of a program called Bridges to Care, uh, which is part of a Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation, CMMI grant. We're one of four sites uh, who's been charged with looking at uh, the Jeff Brenner Camden model to see if there's an opportunity to innovate and decrease utilization uh, in emergency departments and the inpatient setting uh, in different communities. Uh, this is a grant that's over three years, which will be ending this summer. Uh, and part of the program and part of the opportunity was for uh, local communities uh, to see what interventions were required within their community. So the program that we have created, Bridges to Care, uh, is a uh, coaching model for uh, high utilizers of the healthcare system or frequent utilizers. We've enrolled about 550 patients to date since 2012. Uh, these are patients who have had three emergency department visits in six months or two inpatient admissions in the last six months. Uh, we have uh, included patients who have a mental health diagnosis, which is unique compared to other models across the country. No other models uh, have uh, included those patients. During uh, our, our intervention includes home visits uh, and we have a graduation program. The point of the program is to educate patients and to empower them about what their health, uh, about health, and what 
the opportunities are to seek health care within the system uh, and where the most appropriate place is to seek that care and also to really identify what those drivers are in terms of utilization. We have a two-month program uh, where patients get home visits. These include mental health visits uh, and medical visits or shared if necessary. Uh, includes a health coach. It also includes uh, advocates and patient navigators. During this time period, uh, at least to date, our results, which are also unpublished uh, until we've uh, finished <laughs> our enrollment period, uh, but to date we've identified a number of things. Number one, 80% of our patients have both a mental health diagnosis and a diagnosis related to a chronic pain condition. After our intervention, 90% of patients, uh, six months post-intervention, uh, are still utilizing primary care services, uh, which has been a great success. Overall, we've seen a 40% reduction in emergency department and inpatient visits, uh, and we've showed a cost savings of over $2 million to the healthcare system, which is about $20,000 per patient. Uh, some of the challenges that we have identified are that patients have said their number one issue in terms of uh, deciding when and where to access health care is transportation. Uh, homelessness has also been a very large driver of utilization uh, and has been a challenge for us to intervene. Uh, we have been able to show marked reductions in uh, utilization uh, related to patients who have both chronic pain and mental health issues, but making sure that there's a shared model of the physical health and the mental health to be addressed together has been critically important. Uh, and we are happy to show that it, it, our model has been successful from that perspective. Uh, the other challenge we've had is data sharing. Uh, we have a hospital, uh, a, fa a faculty practice plan, uh, community partners, and also our federally qualified health centers. And we had to have BAAs and MOUs and contracts for us to do data sharing, despite the fact that we have a regional health uh, information system and an electronic health record. Um, but because of the issues regarding HIPAA, that's been a significant challenge. Uh, we have, there's many future steps. Uh, the one that we're most proud of is that we've been able to partner with our local Medicaid vendor, Colorado Access, uh, to have them pay for, on a PMPM -PM basis, uh, to have embedded nurse case managers in our emergency department to touch our Medicaid patients. Uh, it's been a novel way for us to align our payers and our providers and also with our uh, outpatient clinics uh, as a way to touch patients uh, because they said they were having a real challenge trying to identify their patients and get them attributed to medical homes. And we said that's because they're in our emergency department. Uh, so it's been a great opportunity to do that warm touch. What we found in our study is when we were doing retrospective enrollment of patients after they came to the emergency department to ask them if they wanted to participate, we were enrolling about 100 patients per uh, six month period. But after we did a live touch in the emergency department during the time when a patient was in acute crisis and were able to do uh, coaching and counseling at the bedside, we were able to enroll over 100 patients per month into our program. So we know that that opportunity in the emergency department to touch the patient is a critical one, which has significant downstream effects uh, within our community. The other things that we're looking at are uh, future opportunities to involve uh, paramedicine when we're talking to our ambulance uh, organization and also uh, we have acute behavior health um, services now available within our community and we're working with the mayor's office to see what opportunities we might have uh, to improve pre-hospital care and transitions. We also have over 40 clinical care pathways uh, and we're looking at diagnoses that include chronic pain like back pain and cyclic vomiting, which we're seeing a lot of now that we uh, have legalized marijuana within our state. Uh, so looking at opportunities to decrease variability and improve outcomes uh, for patients uh, with various medical conditions, including chronic pain conditions. Great. Well, thanks so much to our uh, esteemed panel for uh, sharing with us uh, these wonderful interventions. You, you all are tru truly the leaders in our, in our specialty, and I uh, salute your work. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, ask a few questions uh, that commonly come up um, uh, when you're trying to do interventions uh, like this. Uh, so, Furman, with, with your intervention, uh, um, what, what sort of resources were necessary um, and, and what resources needed to really be brought to the table uh, to, to do the types of interventions that are happening at, at your hospital? 
So I guess we'll go from the, the cheapest to the most expensive. Um, low risk chest pain protocol really was a utilization and organization of resources and processes that did not require uh, additional you know, FTEs or investments by either the hospital or physician group. Um, it may, if we want to increase, right now we use a modified TEMI score, and I'd like to go to a heart score, which would, you know, zero to three, and actually increase the total number of patients that we can uh, put through the low-risk chest pain protocol. So there could be some future expense if we want to expand it further. High-risk care plans initially uh, was nothing more than reorganization of resources when we were just doing our pilot program. When they saw the net benefit, the hospital immediately added uh, 1.5 FTEs to amplify the effect of the high-risk care plan as well as invested in the IT infrastructure uh, to uh, further improve the communication uh, through, our, uh, through our EMR. So there, there was some additional resources there to increase from the 44 patients in the pilot study to over 882. We used a criteria of five ED visits, two admissions, or one readmission during any one 12-month period of time to identify our high-frequency utilizers. Um, the, uh, the patient callback program actually probably you know, is, is still considered low-cost comparative uh, to some of these other initiatives, but... Um, you know, probably is about number three, and uh, that just requires reimbursement to be able to, to, you know, increase participation. The care clinic was the most expensive and probably the the, the biggest gamble, if you will. Uh, over a million dollars uh, invested by the hospital and banking on disease management, chronic pain patients, uh, integrating the high-risk care plan patients, and anyone with no doc or no uh, primary care provider. So that one, uh, results remain to be seen. Uh, they do have the infrastructure set. One of the first things that we're gonna do is uh, take our cellulitis patients. They wanna employ a ID physician to essentially offer 24 hour follow-up for cellulitis patients, which I think would be very effective in decreasing our total number of cellulitis patients that we admitted, which have several, you know, they're usually two, three, four hospital uh, day patients. So. Uh, I'm interested to see how that effective that will be, and we'll see if uh, the, the ROI is there uh, for that particular intervention. Great. Thank you. Uh, you. You know, I think what we see there is that, um, and I think one of our major messages is, is that in order to improve acute care delivery, uh, we, organizations need to make investments in, in new programs and, and create additional uh, capacities and, and capabilities. Um, and, and I think, you know, payment reform, at least in Maryland, is really created the, the incentive uh, to do a lot of that. Uh, next, I'm gonna move to, to Nathan. Um, one of the key uh, barriers uh, to uh, re reform uh, is, is often engagement of providers. Uh, if providers are not at the table uh, for, for the discussion uh, and, and are not interested in, in, um, in, in engaging, uh, it, it can cause major problems and often cause um, programs to fail. Can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, barriers and facilitators to engagement in your program? Well, I think one of the, the barriers uh, is physician engagement. I think we have to change that as a culture. Uh, and as we sometimes say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, and so we've got to work with our physician colleagues to help change their view. But I, I think what it was was an opportunity in our case to do two things. We had a shared crisis. We had a sort of Damocles over our head that fundamentally said, you do something or we're going to do it to you, which may be not the most constructive way to get there, is a great common motivator. Uh, but then we went back and we really did say after we won the lawsuit uh, with the state, rather than just saying we won, let's walk away, you know, wave the victory flag, we said, you know, we actually have things as providers that we fundamentally believe would make our life better, would make the patient care better, and would save the state money. Nobody just ever asks us. We have a chance now to give some feedback. We get to do a patient satisfaction or provider satisfaction for the state. Uh, and say what we need. And that engaged the physicians to really get to a point where they never felt like, or hopefully didn't feel like, it was someone else telling them how to improve their practice. They got to do the things that they always wanted to do. They got to have a standardized narcotic plan so that I wasn't the only one doing it and they would walk down to my frenemy's shop uh, and there they would be so much nicer and you know, give them what they want or vice versa. You know, I wasn't the only one enforcing the rules. And I also had the opportunity to provide them with resources with our case managers that they didn't have before. 
And so many of these patients, what they need is help with access to the system. In our look at our frequent flyers, 90% had mental health issues. 45% had some concomitant substance abuse dual diagnoses. Those are difficult patients, and so giving them resources and allowing us to help them get better care was a way to break through that. But it took engaging the physicians to really drive that change home. Great, thank you. You know, I, I think just to reiterate, I think engaging providers is absolutely necessary um, in any delivery system reform. You know, particularly that 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 impacts uh, emergency care, uh, and, and and really there are a lot of things that uh, reform can do to actually make providers' lives better. And you know, the degree to which we can create a win-win, uh, which it sounds like all all these programs have. Uh, you know, I think that really. Uh, makes a successful program. Uh, next, I'm going to move to, to Jennifer. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how uh, payment reform, uh, you know, particularly in your program, has really, uh, you know, caused your, your your group to really step up to the plate um, and, and and create uh, you know new, you know new models of care delivery. So Colorado, I think, is unique in that it was one of the first states to really embrace the exchanges uh, and deliver and start to think about some innovative payment models, especially. Uh, for Medicaid patients. Uh, in my own uh, emergency department, Medicaid is all, over 50% of our patient population, so a significant payer. Uh, so two of those innovations have been uh, the Medicaid creating regional care collaborative organizations, or RICOs. Uh, so it gave us an opportunity to partner with this vendor um, in ways uh, that I described before with regards to the case manager, uh, because those RICOs are incented by the state uh, to uh, decrease costs, uh, to create patient attribution for medical homes uh, and then to actually drive care to those medical homes. Uh, and there's a per member per month or a PMPM PM payment that's made for those case managers. Uh, so partnering with them to actually show data that shows that these phone calls are not as effective as actually these warm touches at the bedside was the opportunity for us to partner uh, with our hospital to actually place those um, care managers in our emergency department. Now the challenge is this data issue. So what we've actually done to circumvent that is to have uh, a contract from the RICO to the hospital and health system uh, so that these uh, nurse case managers are employees now of our hospital and health system, but there's a funds flow from the RICO so that they can have access to the electronic health records. Uh, that was our workaround uh, to make sure that we were uh, patient-centered but also efficient. Uh, the other thing that uh, has also driven uh, some, some payment reforms, which has also uh, driven some uh, behavior changes within our system, uh, are incentive payments to the hospital for case management services uh, that are part of the health system. Uh, and so uh, that has also helped us to try to increase the number of people who are on our team. What we have found, as with anything, is that uh, there are a number of different services that patients need. And quite frankly, as I described before, they're not sexy. Some of them are uh, transportation issues and, as I said before, homelessness issues, sometimes childcare related issues. Uh, and we have found that patient navigators, uh, even though our nurse case managers are exceptional, they're very expensive. Uh, and so we've engaged um, uh, students as patient navigators uh, and we're actually doing formal training programs uh, for other folks uh, who are less expensive. In some programs, they actually use volunteers also uh, to try to, um, uh, de to uh, do these uh, timely but critically important um, counseling and intervention conversations uh, because with each patient it's really trying to find out what those drivers are that's critically important to understanding what the barriers are for their access. Uh, and I would like to mention uh, that I did not identify I'm part of a very uh, large team but Drs. Barry Martin, uh, Greg Miske, Roberta Kapp, uh, and Heather Logan have been absolutely critical uh, in um, the success of our program to date. Great, thank you. So, so my next question is actually for uh, all uh, three of our panelists. Um, I'd like to uh, have each of you describe uh, what your uh, biggest challenge was in implementing your program uh, and maybe name uh, one, one or two uh, sort of key next steps um, in you know, where you're gonna take the program in the future that you haven't mentioned so far. I mean. So uh, <clears throat> well, with regards to the biggest barriers, uh, you know, there, there's the, the physician buy-in or apprehension right now I think, you know, driving the message home that, you know, emergency physicians, we've, we've been training for the worst case scenarios and uh, I've been uh, billing it as uh, essentially we're going to see more of the patients that we were trained to see to begin with. Uh, and I truly believe that. 
getting them to utilize the protocols and monitor compliance, making sure that uh, they're doing it appropriately. I, I've actually been very encouraged at how uh, very active and uh, positive our group has been. Uh, I, I think it's helped both with hospital uh, support and you know, incorporating some protections, and, you know, even incorporating the low-risk chest pain uh, you know, protocol within hospital uh, bylaws and, and, uh, and MEC uh, policies so that you know, it, it's actually considered a standard of care. Uh, I, I think that will continue, the, the biggest friction is going to be this case management emergency physician where you know they they feel a patient isn't going to warrant admission, and we say, well, there's you know it's 90 year old with nobody at home who is not able to walk. How am I going to be able to send them home? And uh, those are going to be future um, you know, problems that I see moving forward. That hopefully we'll continue to work in a collaborative fashion to be able to handle together and and continue to drive the the, the utilization in a, a smart, evidence based uh, way that still maintains high quality. I think our greatest challenge was actually uh, building trust. Uh, and that seems a little odd, I think, but our greatest challenge was that our payment mechanism for doing this was not to alter payments by a point here or a point there, but to have a, that sort of Damocles, that if we did not do this reform, we would go back to the three visit lists and probably return to court. Uh, but it also meant that there was no power among any side. You know, there was a concern from the payer side that the physicians just wouldn't do it. Why would they engage? Historically, physicians don't always engage. From the provider side, it was even if we do our best, the state will come back and just make another list. You know, and so it led to this very interesting dynamic where we had to rebuild trust, especially when we had just been litigants in court with each other, to say, we'd like to work together now. Mm -hmm. uh, it was tough. But you know, we got through it, I think, by seeing the shared benefit. And out of that has borne this relationship now that we work together actually amazingly collaboratively because I think we all believe that delivering better care to these patients will improve all of our lives. And it was sometimes breaking down that message. There was a famous quote in uh, our local paper by, at the time, CMO of the Medicaid system that drove to the heart of the problem. That ER doctors and hospitals have been abusing their privileges uh, by over-testing and over-utilizing resources. And it was one of those interesting things that we just had to go back to and say, look, as ER doctors, you talk about diaper rash. As an ER doctor, I, I get paid $12.11 in Washington State for diaper rash. That doesn't cover my malpractice or billing. We're in this together to not have diaper rash in the ER. This is the net driver of loss for both of us. And that concept that there was actually a shared gain to be had that didn't require complicated mathematical formulas, but the idea that there were real savings to be had for everyone if we delivered better patient care really was the transformative process of building that trust. And when we could start to learn to talk like each other and see it from each other's perspective, it really, I think, fostered that creative engine that now is moving forward. In terms of where do we go next, um, and what we're actually trying to do is now engage the primary care providers. Uh, that seems odd, I know, but uh, we're trying to engage them in real time to have them participate in the care because, as you've heard, it is tough in a 15-minute schedule. I have a wife that, that's a primary care provider. I know how challenging their days are. So we're trying to engage our primary care providers, and we're going out to the private plans. Uh, the plan that we created while focused on Medicaid actually applied to every patient and every payer in the state. And so I know how much we save for Medicaid, which doesn't pay much. I'm pretty certain the private plan saved a lot more money, and they're now all joining us at the table to say, how can we do something else to continue to improve on the success? So that's our exciting future. In addition to the challenges I described before, one of the biggest challenges for us um, was this payment issue. Even though we were getting small PMPM PM payments uh, for these nurse case managers, it's not enough to cover their salaries. Uh, emergency medicine has focused for so long on efficiency-related quality measures of all of the IOM uh, domains uh, that uh, moving patients efficiently through the system is critically important, but often case management takes a lot of time. Uh, and so there's this perverse incentive for us to move patients quickly, uh, yet uh, knowing that this is an important service to provide them, where do you allow that space to occur and show it's valued? Currently, there's no CPT code and there's no RVUs for acute care coordination services to be provided in the ED. 
uh, and that is critically uh, a, a, it is a critically important service that we provide that is not being valued. So our biggest barrier is trying to convince uh, the hospital that it's important uh, to provide these services when also these patients, if they do have Medicaid for us, are still paying. Uh, and so in a fee-for-service environment, again, it's trying to decrease uh, utilization, which drives down uh, their revenues in some respects. Uh, so that has been a real challenge. Uh, in terms of next steps for us, uh, in addition to those that I've described, it's really for us to look in and at these behavior health conditions and drill down into the chronic pain, behavior health, uh, and physical health conditions. We know patients who have chronic health conditions and stage renal disease and CHF, it is really hard for us to try to uh, change utilization in patients who have that as an additional comorbid condition. Uh, so we want to drill in and see what other opportunities there might be to do things better. And the way that we've done that is by um, engaging graduates from our program who now sit on our patient advisory board uh, and actually have become managers of our program in terms of our health coaches. They have been critically important to help us not only do peer-to-peer -peer education and counseling, um, but also to help us to think of how we might create interventions in a new and innovative way. Well, thank you. Uh, so at this point, I think we've got a few minutes for uh, audience questions. So go ahead. Right there. Yeah. Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician. Uh, for the gentleman from Maryland, I live in Maryland. What's a high risk care program or plan? Is is that risk of coming back into the emergency room or risk of uh, getting really sick um, or legal risk? I'm not sure. So the high risk care plan patient essentially refers to patients that are at risk for a increased use of hospital and ED resources. Uh, so, so frequent flyers, high frequency utilizers. Um, that, but we did change the focus. The, the identification of these patients really came from the inpatient side. So we, unlike you know, maybe some other care plan programs where the emphasis is on the psychiatric or the uh, prescription drug abuse or, or standard uh, abuse of any uh, medications. It really, I'll give you one of the best first care plan patients we had was a patient who had end-stage coronary artery disease, had three cardiac casts because every time he came in, his EKG showed a STEMI. But every time they cathed him, because we were so you know, bent on the door to balloon time, no one was able to look at his health uh, record in time to realize that there was no intervention to be had. So uh, that care plan alone provided that patient with a better, hopefully a better uh, life of not getting continually poked in the groin every time <laughs> he had chest pain. So um, these patients have a, a you know, large uh, proportion. I think over 60% of them had uh, you know, COPD, CHF, or other chronic conditions that we had to deal with. Other questions? Um, with Medicare sort of being this sort of Damocles in Maryland with the waiver and you had uh, Nathan, the Medicaid. What what do you see going forward? I know you started to talk a little bit about the private sector of engaging more of the the private sector insurers to support some of these um, mechanisms and, and other ways to reduce costs and, and ED visits. Sure. I think there's a number of ways, uh, and one is communication. So uh, we've talked to, to some of our payers about these opportunities. Again, um, this, the fact that care coordination takes time, so valuing that as a service, giving access to information. Not all of our patients utilize just my hospital. Um, so uh, really having someone to take that uh, important pause uh, and gather all the information that the provider needs to see if they would make a different decision about disposition for that patient is critically important. Also, uh, without having uh, someone at the bedside who's an expert in knowing what services are available to that payer, um, you don't know what SNF, LTAC, home care services, uh, next day appointments might be available. Uh, so uh, partnering with uh, the payers to think about um, someone who might be an expert to give you that timely information. Again, providers want to do the right thing, um, but we only have a short amount of time to engage with the patient, so we really need other partners who can access all that information so we can make an informed decision to do the right thing for the patient. 
And I think when we move forward, I, I'm going to say something mildly heretical, but it should be simple and not complicated. Uh, which is the antithesis of most uh, Medicare programs. Uh, but it is the reality, you know, as ER docs, you know, we follow the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, uh, because we don't want to miss things. And whether or not it's a 2% plus or minus probably isn't going to change dramatically how we practice care. But the additional resources that create a shared win and helping people to see that by doing things together, we can all win, even though it's maybe counterintuitive. Convincing hospitals that less patients is a good thing seems counterintuitive, but working at a county trauma center that has boarded as many as 39 patients in my 33 beds and seeing 160 patients a day, I can tell you getting a few patients out of the ER is a win for my hospital. It will help them overall. It's a win for the doctors not to see the $12.11 diaper rash from Medicaid. It's a win for Medicaid because they're not necessarily paying that ER visit or the facility fee more importantly than the $12.11. There's shared wins to be had, and so it's getting the resources there, and I think making these things simple, rather than getting everyone with their back against the wall. And I think we have some real low-hanging fruit in all of these examples of why don't we have an outpatient chest pain clinic in every system delivery of healthcare? We're trying to build one right now. So I'm going to talk to you after this, uh, you know, that literally we're trying to get up and running. It makes complete sense. We've been doing case management. Why is that not in every department in the country? Why are we not having large health systems drive this conversation in partnership with the insurance companies, even if it takes a few dollars up front? It saves us large dollars down the road, but it doesn't take complicated plans. It says let's take one low-hanging fruit and move forward together it'll probably all shake out pretty well in the end for everyone. One intervention I didn't mention uh, if with Medicaid that we've been looking at in terms of the low-lying fruit is uh, developing a uh, Medicaid cab, so an Uber for yeah. Medicaid, <laughs> because transportation has been such a challenge for us. Uh, you know, again, the, looking to see what's out, what else is out in the marketplace as opportunities for us, um, which may be a low-lying fruit. And some of the future initiatives that we have put forward have been everything from telehealth. We were working with a, the uh, MHCC grant, a $30,000 grant that allowed us to try and decrease skilled nursing facility readmissions and allow, allowing uh, emergency physicians to actually connect with the uh, a skilled nursing facility to see if we can't do more to prevent, uh, to essentially care for the patient there. It was actually very effective during the influenza uh, season that we had. You may have heard that was pretty big. The um, the uh, ability to keep those patients away from the emergency department actually was very beneficial both to patient and to uh, to the hospital as well as to the emergency department. I agree. We're not going to get any more capacity. I don't think there's a single builder in the entire state of Maryland that, that is working on a hospital at this point. So we're not going to get more capacity. The only way we're going to get more capacity is by getting more efficient as well as providing alternatives. And I think telehealth, I think, uh, you know, these uh, clinical pathways, increasing discharges with appropriate follow-up are, are definitely the first, you know, low-hanging fruits. Uh, I think it, it's going to get more difficult. I mean, we've partnered with Meals on Wheels just to try and provide, you know, uh, we had one ED patient that came because they, he liked our turkey sandwiches. So, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, there, there are, uh, there's plenty of work to be done. It's, it's going to get more difficult once we finish the low-hanging fruit. I think that's a great uh, suggestion about telehealth. I think that's critically important. The private payers could take the lead on telehealth. Uh, we're already seeing disruptors in the marketplace, right? People, most people have iPhones or have phones, some of which are iPhones, uh, but be, to be able to do Skype or to iChat with folks um, are what some of these other uh, commercial vendors are doing. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us to think about being that diagnostic center um, and also potentially engage our consultants through the ED because we have access to so many other services. So if private payers are willing to pay for telehealth services, uh, that'd be an excellent opportunity uh, for us to decrease uh, utilization and be patient-centered. Great, thank you. Other questions? Go ahead. You is, you guys are all part of large health systems, and you have large resources, or I guess for you, Dr. Schlicker, at least with ASAP, you know, you're part of a larger organization, you affect a change. For a private group that wants to get involved in integrated care, what do you see as the opportunities, or do you see that you need 
you know, all the resources that a large system has to make a dent. And I'll tell you from our perspective, our solutions didn't come from being part of a large system. We were at the time a five hospital system out of 96 in the state of Washington. It came from that larger conversation. Um, I think it's being involved in whatever group is doing it and making a seat at the table for yourself, um, getting engaged, whether that's through the Maryland chapter of ASEP, if they're working on these things, if it's CMMI directly engagement grants. Um, there's lots of opportunities to do these things, but at some level it does take everybody wanting to work on it because if you are in one hospital, you know, we had been working on much of the pieces of our puzzle as the Franciscan Health System, but our HIE agreement that was the BBA was sitting on a lawyer's desk for two and a half years. Call them up after two and a half years of working on this and it's always, you know, there's an unnamed attorney. Uh, I was an attorney in a prior life so I can speak ill of attorneys every once in a while. Uh, but, uh, and could never find out who it was. Could never move it forward in two and a half years. The state came through with their, we're just not gonna pay you for, you know, various things and my hospital stood to lose five million dollars in just one of our hospitals. It took two days to get the agreement signed. Sometimes you can't do it by yourself. You have to get everybody there. But when the opportunities present themselves, that's when I think we have to jump in head first and really lead the conversation. So Rich McLean, uh, who I have to acknowledge, uh, is uh, part of Together Colorado, the faith-based organization I talked about before. Uh, and it was one man uh, with a small community uh, engagement group who had a vision of trying to create um, better access for patients uh, within his community. And that's how our program started. Uh, it literally was one advocacy group who approached um, a handful of providers and said, what can we do better? Uh, now, getting a grant to help uh, actually operationalize some of these larger initiatives uh, was absolutely critical to us moving uh, more efficiently and quickly uh, and being able to study what uh, an intervention and outcomes. Uh, but for us, it really started with a grassroots organization. So I think we've got time for uh, one final question. Laura? Well, thank you for a very interesting discussion. Um, I was noticing that, that I think through the thread of um, all of the innovations was uh, some component of decreasing variation in emergency physician practice uh, by creating uh, pathways and protocols. And so I wanted to ask the panel to comment on your thoughts on the balance between clinical judgment and physician autonomy and application of the best evidence and the importance of that to uh, reforming the department practice. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this is something that Laura and I actually have been working on and trying to figure out ourselves. And uh, I, I think the acute episodic chief complaints are going to be the low-hanging fruit again, the chest pain and the evidence pain. The, the more difficult challenges um, are going to be the chronic care conditions, the, the chronic conditions of you know, COPD, CHF that require more integrative solutions. That's going to be the challenge of trying to uh, connect IT infrastructure, uh, you know, just within our own institution. We have three different IT uh, databases, you know, for outpatient, inpatient, and for even the, within the emergency department. So it's going to be a, a future challenge. That physician autonomy, uh, it, is going to have to be also linked, uh, physician practice is going to have to be linked to clinical outcome measures. And, uh, and we know the, uh, the devil's in the details with regards to those, but uh, in the end, uh, you know, making sure that we provide the best evidence to the physician so that they have buy-in uh, is going to be step one. Uh, being able to measure both compliance as well as clinical outcomes will be step two. And how well we do that will show, I think, how effective we will be in decreasing clinical variation where we can. I think it's important to differentiate two types of care plans. There's one that's the care plan that's driving towards evidence-based medicine for low-risk chest pain that we can do a heart score and do an outpatient workup like the National Health Service did with TIA in Britain 10 years ago. That's one evidence-based medic component, but I think where almost all of our care plans have gone is targeting those that don't fall into a bucket of a diagnostic pathway, but are complicated, multifactorial, mental health, substance abuse, concomitant comorbid medical conditions that still require a dramatic amount of physician autonomy, insight, and 
thought process, but also require having a decent amount of data to make those decisions intelligently. And so the care plans that we developed are saying there's no cathable lesion. This patient doesn't need calibator for their hereditary angioedema. We have a care plan for one patient that's got HAE, and Heather and I both know her. Uh, and so it bounced back between our facilities. In the old days, that's $10,000 a pop. And so just that in the care plan. So those are the types of things that I think are, don't infringe upon physician and tonic, but actually allow us to do our job better and get to the point where we all want to be, but that aren't protocolized. Some things like opioids and chest pain, hopefully we'll go to and we'll have metrics on those. And I don't think most physicians think that's the wrong way to go. For us, it was about data transparency and accountability. One of the first things my chairman, Richard Zane, did uh, was do an analysis of utilization of high cost imaging by provider. Uh, and I'm in an academic center, so we think you know we're the, the brightest and we have the brightest residents. Uh, and when we looked at the variation, there was two standard deviations of variation among our providers. So that really gave us an opportunity to have the conversation to say there are clearly outliers in terms of utilization. Not everyone can be right. Uh, so let's talk about being patient-centered uh, and looking at the best evidence. The challenge is, is that the clinicians in the room know, looking at the evidence requires interpretation. Uh, and that what's written in the literature, you cannot just write into EPIC uh, or into the medical record and implement. It really requires important uh, understanding about what your local culture is, maybe what your antibiotic resistance is, et cetera, et cetera. There's many nuances. So we've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours developing our over 40 clinical care pathways for common diagnoses, cellulitis, kidney stones, back pain, chest pain, et cetera. Uh, and we say they follow the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of patients uh, should be able to follow this care pathway for one diagnosis. Now the challenge are these complex uh, patients who have multiple diagnoses. But it's really been a way for us to change how we think about um, decreasing variability in care uh, without sacrificing autonomy, but improving patient outcomes. And I knew we had changed culture in my own organization when our director of trauma surgery said, we need a pathway for that. Uh, so it's been really critical for our organization to start uh, thinking in a different way. And next steps for us are actually to create embedded clinical decision support so that we can better study um, why people are choosing not to follow pathways because it may be absolutely appropriate, um, but we need to understand why. And uh, our EHRs still are not robust and sophisticated enough to allow us to do that uh, in a, a uh, sophisticated and elegant way. Uh, so we hope to be able to implement that in the next year. Great. Well, thank you to our uh, panel today. Um, you know, I think the, the clear message here is that um, you know, uh, the improvement in um, you know value in acute care is possible. Uh, you know, when when there's the right impetus and when you have uh, dynamic leadership, um, you know, leaders like yourself at the table to to really implement these interventions uh, and, and engage the right people. Um, you know, bring the right right folks to the table. Um, you know, in Maryland, we, we saw we see how global payments um, have really uh, led to a, a lot of important interventions that are really um, reducing costs of care, uh, really having the acute our uh, emergency department uh, take responsibility for patients af after they leave um, and, and really following patients across the continuum. In Colorado, we're seeing a focus on uh, really the highest risk patients, those with uh, mental health issues and, and medical issues, uh, and focusing on logistics for those patients, wh which we know is, is a major barrier. Uh, and finally, in Washington State, we saw how the threat of non-payment can cause uh, providers to come together um, and, and, and really do some great work. I uh, just want to go on the record. This, we, we don't want to do, go through this again. I think that uh, in the future, <laughs> we, we want uh, payment reform to be more uh, proactive than, uh, than necessarily threats of non-payment. Well um, thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, so for, for our next panel, um, we'll hear about uh, what the federal government uh, is doing to improve the value of a care, uh, and specifically uh, how structuring payment incentives in the right way uh, can lead to uh, integrated acute care. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mark to lead our next panel.